Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Why don't I start things off with a bit of humor? Recently, I learned uh, a bunch of comedians voted on the funniest religious joke of all time. And it goes like this. Once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. And I said, me too. Uh, what denomination? He said, Baptist. Me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist East Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879? Or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic. <laughs> succeed, as it does, uh, only because we so readily take religion often to be associated with intolerance. Uh, our topic tonight is not faith and intolerance, but uh, the related and more general matter of faith and reason. On this topic, Mark Twain once quipped that faith is believing what you know ain't so. I want to organize my opening remarks around four questions. The first question is this, how did we get where we are? This is a question folks don't often ask, but they should. Well, that is, why is it so common nowadays to think of faith and reason as at odds? In thinking about the relationship of faith and reason, we all are heavily influenced by a story about how things have played out over the centuries. The story says that there has been a long, continuous battle between science and the Christian religion in particular. Many of your professors fervently believe this story, but the story is a complete myth. It's true that there always has been, within Christian churches, a tension between those who are hyper-protective, guardians of orthodoxy, and so very exceedingly cautious about other forms of, of learning that might undermine um, some of the claims that they believe, and those who confidently promoted the serious pursuit of learning. But the promoters of knowledge of our world always had the best theological, theological argument, which goes like this. All of reality is the good creation of God, and we are made in his image. So we ought to use and cultivate the intellectual gifts we have been given. Not to do so would be to dishonor our creator. Much of the supreme confidence in reasoned inquiry at the, do the dawn of the scientific revolution stemmed from belief in the wisdom of nature's wise, infinitely wise author, implying that the world should behave according to understandable and elegant principles. Francis, Francis Bacon famously spoke of God's two books, the book of God's works, or of nature, and the book of God's word. This played out institutionally with the Catholic Church being the major uh, funder of scientific inquiry from the late Middle Ages into the Enlightenment. Individually, many great thinkers in science, uh, philosophy, and other uh, intellectual areas were and are devout Christians. In science, there was Bacon and Newton uh, and numerous others at the, the, the time of the scientific revolution to Francis Collins, head of the Human Genome Project, 
and Harvard astronomer Owen Gingrich today. In philosophy, we have Descartes, Locke, and Leibniz, three real biggies uh, at the founding of modern philosophy, to numerous distinguished Christian philosophers today. Uh, here I won't name names, uh, since uh, scientists have long since eclipsed, eclipsed philosophers, uh, sadly, as the intellectual rock stars. Uh, but you can Google the Society of Christian Philosophers. The battle, uh, of the battle of science and religion myth originated in the Enlightenment and was cemented in the revisionist history books of a couple prominent 19th century critics of religion. Uh, it endures even though it has been entirely discredited by modern historians of science and religion. Uh, on, this, on this topic, you might read some of the essays by historians in a uh, collected volume called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths in Science and Religion. Uh, or you might choose to check out the many resources available online at uh, the BioLogos website, which is run by Christian scientists and scholars. All right, turning from history, my second question is philosophical and twofold. Uh, what is faith? And what people, when they ask that question, don't often go on to ask, what is reason? To reason well, I suggest, is to skillfully and effectively de deploy our basic cognitive capacities. Perception, memory, reasoning in its various forms, handling the testimony of others, um, which by the way, uh, is the source of almost everything that you know. It comes by a testimony in one form or other, if you stop to think about it, from your parents, uh, other people, textbooks, uh, news sources, and on and on and on. Most of what we believe comes from the testimony of others. Faith, as I think of it, is reasoned trust in God's self-revelation and God's promises. I'm speaking speci specifically of Christian faith. I don't think there is generically any such thing as faith. Um, there, the religions are very different animals, and I, I speak as a Christian. Notice that word, though, trust. There's the difference in a nutshell, you might say. Reason looks for evidence. Faith takes things on unquestioned trust. But, but to philosophers used to probing the foundations of human knowledge, it is a boringly familiar truth, though one not very often recognized by others, that reason, too, is rooted in a kind of trust. We simply can't get going in examining the world without First, trusting that the basic cognitive capacities we have are generally reliable. There's no way to get going in thinking about the world. You have to start somewhere, and that's where we all start, including science. So the question for us is not whether taking some things on trust is ever reasonable. The question is st instead is what and whom to trust, and whether our trust is appropriately critical and calibrated over time in response to evidence as we go on. In figuring this out, the wise course strikes a balance between fostering individual autonomy in ourselves and others and taking advantage of the resources and corrective benefits of community. Science is a sprawling um, enterprise, and it's a cooperative enterprise. It is a loose collection. The sciences are a loose, a loose collection of specialized communities interpreting aspects of the Book of Nature in its own terms as an integral system, using intersubjective and empirical methods, and focused on deep patterns and principles, not singular episodes. The Christian theological community is likewise engaged in an ongoing, organized uh, effort, the one that is, to be sure, far messier and far more data poor than science is, uh, it, and it's an effort to interpret the book of God's word, making full use of our reasoning abilities, what we learn from the book of God's works, and our collective cumulative experience. However, we, we should note that doing so well in, in the case of interpreting the book of God's word requires skills and qualities additional to those required to do science. Theology is the attempt not to understand impersonal things and behaviors according to regular laws, but instead to understand the purposive free activities of God, 
uh, in relation to purposive human beings. It takes empathy, discernment of the ways of people, in a word, wisdom. Contrary to reputation, we do gain new theological insights and knowledge over time, as well as lose old ones, too. Of course, plenty of folks in the, the broader church aren't paying much attention to any of that. Uh, th there's an important point here uh, I hope we can get to in discussion, which is that the church is an open door, not self-selecting or elite community. This has both an upside and a downside when it comes to the pursuit of truth. Which brings me to my third question. Is Christian faith irrational? My answer is yes, sometimes. Religious faith for some is uncritical and unreflective. This is sometimes true even of university educated believers for whom the tools and sources of critical examination are readily available. But agnostic and atheist beliefs are also irrational sometimes. For these positions, uh, no less than religious ones, involve commitments concerning what is, uh, what, is, what is there and how we can know and cannot know things. Some make such commitments after careful reflection. Others, many others nowadays it seems to me, adopt them lazily with little or no investigation of the claims of committed <laughs> religious believers. Sad to say, this even includes, in my experience, a few philosophy professors. But many other people, religious and non-religious, carefully reflect on the basis for their beliefs and by all measures exhibit a great deal of intellectual virtue in the process. Contrary to a widespread stereotype, a robust faith is compatible with continued inquiry and openness to the skeptical responses of religious outsiders. It is also compatible with uncertainty on many points of detail. The Christian thinker, indeed, has a distinctively theological reason to suppose that at any given time, some of what she thinks about God and God's purposes are in error. For our faith teaches us that we are prone to vanity and self-deception even in the very act of our pursuit of God. Well, what about doubts over fundamental religious beliefs? Start by noting that the reasonable person holds different beliefs more or less firmly, right? Uh, some, some beliefs I hold lightly and change readily. So I think that uh, IU and uh, Ohio State's men's basketball team will play their first game next season in Bloomington. Then I notice a schedule posted on the wall when I come to campus here that, that indicates otherwise, and I immediately change my belief. I don't hold that belief very firmly. Um, by the way, you all had a very good run this season in men's basketball, uh, but I'm here to warn you that our very young team, or all our players are returning, we are going to absolutely kick butt in the Big Ten. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone has their turn. Where was that? Uh, right. So some beliefs I hold lightly, right? Uh, but when a deeply entrenched belief is in question, especially one connected to what I take to be a powerful explanatory account of a whole field of inquiry, it is not an intellectual virtue for me to be inclined to change my mind every time apparently conflicting evidence appears. One doesn't chuck a powerful scientific theory because of small amounts of evidence that appear to contradict it. Instead, one looks to resolve the discrepancy. Similarly, as a convinced Christian, I don't abandon ship just because on reflection, certain things that seem to be taught in Christian theology don't make complete sense to me. The virtuous experienced thinker learns to live with some measure of dissonance and mild conflict of evidence. Our evidence is never complete, and our grasp on the evidence and its implications is never total. That said, Christian faith is compatible with experiencing doubt, even considerable and at times fundamental doubt. For those who do have such experience, it is no deficiency of faith for one to make an honest effort to grapple with and not to ignore such doubt. All right, my fourth and final question. 
which I imagine someone wanting to pose to me on an occasion like this, uh, is, so Tim, uh, why don't you tell us in, say, 60 seconds or so, however much time I have left, why you are a Christian. Why you are a Christian. Uh, I, uh, so, a bit of autobiography. I had a profound experience of conversion to the Christian faith as a college freshman at the University of Illinois. This came after a lot of reflection and discussion and tentative exploration of Christian community. But in, in the end, my faith was quite unexpected to me. I would describe it as like when you're standing uh, chest deep in calm ocean water facing the shore and suddenly you get hit from a massive wave from behind, right? Uh, at, at some point, I shifted from reading the Gospels, which I've been doing for several months, uh, as the remarkable, a remarkable set of stories, or, or a set of stories about a remarkable man, to reading them as that person speaking to me right now through these texts. There I was, wiped out on the shore, um, and with my face in the sand, asking, what just happened? And that was literally my experience for several months. This naturally led me to want to study philosophy, to try to sort it all out. And so the period of my Christian faith has coincided with what has turned into a lifelong uh, pursuit of the study of philosophy. As I see it, each has benefited from the presence of the other in my life. C.S. Lewis, a popular Christian writer from uh, the mid-20th century, once wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And this captures a good part of my attitude. Christianity is, among many other things, a comprehensive picture of reality, akin in certain ways to an ambitious, highly general scientific theory. As I see it, it helps to explain several things. I'll just tick off quickly. Uh, one, the existence and, as we now are learning, remarkably fine-tuned for life nature of our universe. Uh, two, some deep features of the human condition across time and culture. For example, pervasive religious experiences had by people in every culture that we know about. And the simultaneous, what you might, what uh, Pascal in somewhat angsty kind of way described as the simultaneous moral wretchedness and nobility of individual human beings. Uh, something expressed also by uh, Solzhenitsyn, the famous Soviet dissident. Um, who spent time in the gulags uh, in the 20th century. And, and Solzhenitsyn wanted to say, uh, the line between good and evil doesn't run between communities or kinds of people, it runs uh, right down the middle of every human heart. That is, he recognized in himself, subject uh, to the, the horrible mistreatment that he was for so many years, he too, some, he possessed some of the wickedness that, that some of his tormentors had. Uh, and, and we see it expressed time and again in our finest literature. Uh, Another, another um, striking feature of human nature is that on the, we are simultaneously animals. We're primates, right? But we are also self-aware, morally free beings capable of knowing so much about our vast world. Congruent with these features of the human condition, Christianity teaches that we are made in God's image. We are icons of divine beauty and goodness and freedom. Yet there are crack lines running through us, urgently in need of repair and restoration. In this way, I see Christianity as affirming a robust yet balanced humanism, whereas modern secular thought struggles often between the poles of a rationalistic hubris uh, that denies our built-in limits and a denigration of human persons, especially those least able among us as insignificant elements of a vast and purposeless reality. A third matter Christian teaching helps to explain is more specific, the remarkable life and death of Jesus of Nazareth within the Messianic Judaism of first century Palestine and his subsequent impact. Uh, obviously, there's a whole lot to say uh, about this, uh, uh, and as there is on the other two points that I gestured at. Uh, my time is short, so all I can do is say, you know, these are things we could take up in discussion. In my judgment, the Christian faith provides illuminating explanation on all three of these fronts that is, importantly, complementary to, not rival to, the ever-deepening explanations of science that we find in cosmology and particle physics, in evolutionary biology, in neuroscience and cognitive psychology, 
and also what we can what we can glean from sustained historical study. So the existence of and fine-tuned nature of the universe, deep features of the human condition, uh, the phenomena that was Jesus of Nazareth, and finally a fourth basis for my faith, and I'll close on this, has been my experience of Christian community and what I've managed to learn about the church from its earliest days until now. To be sure, there has been and continues to be much that is ugly in the church. But please bear in mind that the sole factor that binds all Christians together is our response to the unqualified love of God as we understand it. It's not wealth that binds us together, we're rich and poor, it's not politics, we're politically conservative and liberal, uh, it's not matters of temperament, ethnicity, and so on, right? Uh, and this love of God is extended not only to fine, pretty people, such as you and me, but also to the willfully ignorant, to the annoying, to the crazy, and indeed to the downright wicked. And yes, sometimes assortments of such villains in the church have organized some of the rest in appalling activities on scales large and small. The point to see, though, is this. That the church is always a bit of a mess, even at its best, is only to be expected. Right? For in each generation, it makes appeal, precisely the appeal on God's behalf, precisely to those most conscious of their many moral weaknesses and failings. But the church also has been and continues to be a tremendous force for good in this world. And in it, if one looks hard, one finds profound beauty and wisdom and grace. On a personal level, I owe much of whatever strength and maturity of faith that I possess to the examples and insights I have gleaned from those who have nurtured me over the past 28 years now, intellectuals and non-intellectuals alike. So with humility, I hope, and much respect for the goodness plainly visible in people of other faiths and of none, many of whom I am pleased to call friends, I am persuaded of the following. If one, surveys, if one were to survey our globe, looking for historical and moral signs of possible candidates for there being a reasonably cohesive community which a powerful and loving God instituted as a very human vehicle to reveal himself to all of us, there is no better candidate than the Christian community. Thank you. Is this mic working? Uh, when I volunteered for this job, I knew that uh, as the timekeeper, it would be I who would be the inevitable target of your wrath when I hold people accountable to their time. So uh, we had a little bit of time overgo here. I'm going to just, I like seven minutes. <laughs> Do philosophers like to talk? Indeed. Yeah, I just want to make sure we will give you a comparable as well. So. Well, I'm very glad that you're all here. It's, uh, I look out, I see friends and colleagues and students and former students and people I don't know. It just makes me very happy that you're all here. Thank you very much, Professor O'Connor, for your comments. Uh, there will be some overlap uh, between what we say. Uh, I'm not going to respond directly to anything that was said in the previous comments. I'll leave that for when we engage each other during the cross-examination period. Uh, thanks also to the Alliances and to the Veritas Forum for putting this together. This sort of event does my heart good. I think this is exactly the sort of thing that atheists and theists alike need, this sort of reasonable dialogue. So thank you very much. Um, with that said, here are some thoughts. So we all have beliefs, things that we take to be true of reality, ways that we think that things are. Some of our beliefs are quite specific, such as my belief that Professor O'Connor is a philosopher. Others are quite general, such as my belief that almost all dogs have four legs. Now, some of our beliefs are true, they get things right, but some of them don't, and we call them false. Some of them are more justified than others, and some of them aren't justified at all. Now, our beliefs relate to one another in many ways. If I believe that Professor O'Connor is a philosopher, I should also believe that he possesses consciousness. After all, one can be a philosopher only if one possesses consciousness. 
If I believe that almost all dogs have four legs, I should believe that for any arbitrary dog that I consider, but have yet to actually observe, it probably has four legs. Furthermore, if I believe that a dog has four legs, I should not also believe of that dog that it has exactly three legs. We should believe what is entailed by other things we believe, and we should not believe what our current beliefs rule out. Belief is systematic like that. Now we form and revise and evaluate our beliefs all the time, based on the evidence we're presented with and that which we seek out ourselves. Occasionally, when forming a belief or when evaluating an existing one, when it's called into question, we have to evaluate or reevaluate that belief. We then check the facts as well as our other beliefs. If the question belief stands up to scrutiny, we get to keep it. If not, we either reject it, reinterpret the facts, or revise our other beliefs in light of that. Now what I've been gesturing at so far, the ways in which our beliefs hang together and inform one another, the ways in which they can be called into question and then must face the tribunal of evidence, is what we can call reason. We can call any person who in general acts in accordance with reason a reasonable person. Now reason is oftentimes contrasted with faith. But faith is a word that can be said in many ways to mean many things. Sometimes it means trust, such as when I say that I have faith in my partner. Sometimes it means great confidence, such as when I say that I have faith in myself, or in a particular theory or political system. Now I certainly, I personally, certainly have faith in this sense, and I take myself to be reasonable in having it. It's based on evidence. Now, sometimes faith just means hope, such as when I say that I have faith that I'll win the lottery. Of course I hope to win the lottery. I have student loans. <laughs> but I certainly won't start acting as if I'm going to win the lottery just because I hope to. That would be irresponsible. But sometimes the word is used in a far, far stronger manner. Sometimes faith is used as a type of justification for a belief, despite a lack of evidence for that belief. Faith, in this sense, dictates that certain beliefs are simply not called into question, or if they are, that our faith alone is enough to justify us in retaining them, even if they stand to fail up to scrutiny. Fail to stand up to scrutiny. That's what I'll mean by faith for the rest of these comments. Now, can a reasonable person adopt a religious worldview? Certainly. As long as, as far as they can tell, it's consistent with their other beliefs, the evidence they see in the world, and most importantly, itself. In fact, if a person is going to adopt a religious worldview, she should do it on the basis of reason. If one does it on faith alone, that's condoning belief without evidence. If she can own such a thing for herself, that's condoning the same thing for others as well. And that's no good. Of course, I don't deny that everyone's entitled to their beliefs, of course not. But on the picture that I'm considering right now, it turns out that almost anyone could be justified in believing pretty much anything just by having faith in it. That's what I deny, and I imagine that you deny it too. It's too permissive. Imagine someone claiming to be justified in believing that, say, genocide is permissible because they have faith that it is. That would be horrifying. You might say, that's different. But if you do, then I say the burden is on you to tell me why and how it's different. But now, if someone has a religious worldview that is consistent with her other beliefs, the evidence she sees in the world, and itself, is that good enough? Not quite yet. After all, consistency is cheap. Lots of things might be consistent with your beliefs, the evidence, and themselves. All we get from a worldview's being consistent with such things is that it might be true, not that it is true. Of the various options that might be true, how do we decide which one to adopt? Taking one of them, to be true on grounds of faith, that is, using faith as a sort of tiebreaker, lands us in the problem I mentioned just a moment ago. Instead, what we do is we look for further evidence that tells in favor of one view and not the others. Put another way, we adopt the one that we have the most reason to adopt. If no evidence supports any of them, we don't believe any of them. Reason does not dictate, after all, that I believe that which is merely consistent with my other beliefs, the evidence in itself. If I believe that you have a dog, I should not go on to believe that you have a cat merely because it's consistent with you having a dog that you also have a cat. <coughs> to be justified in believing that you have a cat, I need some reason to believe that you have a cat. Now, I'm an atheist. 
I believe that there is no God. And I'm not ashamed of this fact, nor am I particularly proud of it. I'm actually about as ashamed of it as I am that I don't believe in ghosts, or the ether, or the free lunch, and about as proud. I just don't see what there is to be ashamed or proud of. But I was asked to say a little bit about why I'm an atheist, so I'll say that now. Why do I believe that there is no God? Well, I look for evidence for such a being, some reason to believe that it's there. There's been plenty of purported evidence, the existence of morality, biological complexity in nature, the apparent fine-tuning of the universe for life, the fact that anything exists at all. None of these arguments work, however, for reasons that have been well rehearsed elsewhere. Due to limitations on time, I won't be able to go through and say why I don't think they work, but I'd be happy to do that during the Q&A. Now the arguments all either fail to support their conclusions, or they get us conclusions that are actually consistent with the denial of theism. Now theists can occasionally have the tendency to acknowledge that these arguments are weak, but go on to suppose that by collecting them up and relying on them collectively, they can build a stronger case for their view. But this is to make the mistake of thinking that a bunch of bad arguments adds up to anything other than a bunch of bad arguments. Now many will say that in light of this absence of evidence, we should simply be agnostic and refrain from either theism or atheism. Absence of evidence, so some might say, isn't evidence of absence. But we don't really believe that. When I was a child, I was perplexed by the light that would turn off and on inside my fridge whenever I would shut or open the door. I concluded, as any child might, that there was a little gremlin in the fridge whose job it was to turn that light on and off. Now, years later, I discovered that little button. Spoiler alert. Now, at that point, I could have said, oh, that's it. There's a button and a gremlin. No, once I discovered the button, I no longer had any reason to believe in the gremlin despite the fact that its existence was compatible with everything else I believed at the time. So I stopped believing in the gremlin, and I imagine that you would have too. I hope. <laughs> or imagine that you're serving on the jury for a murder case. Someone boldly conjectures there was an accomplice. An investigation ensues, and no evidence of an accomplice turns up. What happens? Well, the case continues on as if there was no accomplice. Surely, we can acknowledge that we might be wrong. There might have been an accomplice. But in a court of law, we care about getting things right, and if there's no evidence that there was an accomplice, we carry on as if there wasn't one. If new evidence shows up, that's great, but until it does, we do not continue to seriously entertain that conjecture. Now, some say that the fact that there is no evidence available for God's existence is an ingenious part of God's plan, since God would want us to believe in him even if there was a lack of evidence. After all, God wants us to have faith. But if I said to my fellow jurors, of course there's no evidence for the accomplice, that's because the accomplice wants to stay hidden, they probably would just move on to a new topic. Now suppose some physicists are searching for a purported subatomic particle, but after looking carefully, they can find no evidence for it. Most of them abandon the project, but one of them speaks up. Of course we can't find evidence, he says. This particular particle wants to stay hidden. It's in its nature to remain unfound. I imagine that this would be very bad for this physicist's career. The default position, I claim, is atheism, not agnosticism. And if the theist wants to make a case, well, she has to do just that. She has to make a case. She has to bear the burden of proof. She needs to offer positive reason to believe in God. The theist needs to earn her position in a way that the atheist does not need to earn her atheism. Of course, this is all putting aside the fact that the existence of God, at least as traditionally conceived of in the West, is made unlikely by the evidence that we see. There's suffering in the world, we all know that. Now this alone is not enough to rule out the existence of an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God, since as it's often claimed, much of the suffering is either the result of human free will, a supposedly valuable gift that we've been supposedly given, or it's there so that we can overcome it and build character, developing virtue along the way. After all, we can't develop courage if there's nothing out there to be afraid of. But we should not forget that there is some suffering in the world that is neither due to free will nor instrumental for some higher order good like courage. Just think of all the suffering in the natural world, out in nature, the suffering that we don't observe. To borrow an example from the philosopher William Rowe, a deer 
is walking through the woods when a storm breaks out. A tree is struck by lightning and falls, pinning the deer to the ground. The tree catches fire, burning the deer badly until it's put out by the rain. The deer lays there, pinned under the tree in agony from the burns, lingering on until it's unfortunate death. This is not the result of free will. Suppose this happens on an island uninhabited by humans and no one ever finds out about it. Then can't serve to build virtue or character. This is superfluous suffering, which counts as evidence against the existence of the all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God. Sure, maybe hearing the story builds character in us. It helps us develop sympathy, perhaps. But it surely doesn't need to come true in order to do that. <coughs> but stories like this do come true, and we have reason to believe that they come true all the time. God could help build virtue by spreading the stories without having them come true, but he allows them to. And I take this to be direct evidence against theism. Now so far, I've been looking at external, empirical data gleaned from the observable physical world. At some point during all of this, you might have wondered, what about the other data? What about the internal data? The fact that people have religious experiences. That has to count for something, right? People feel God directly, they say. Or to put it more precisely, they have intense feelings that lead them to believe that they are feeling God directly. The best explanation, they say, of these feelings is that God really is behind them. The problem with an appeal to religious experience as data in favor of a particular religious worldview is that people who have purportedly religious experiences tend to interpret them within the trappings of the religion they practice. Catholics are visited by saints, not Shiva. Hindus encounter neither kami nor angels. Atheists, on top of that, can have these experiences too, though they would probably not describe them as religious experiences, more as experiences of transcendence or of the sublime. Purportedly, religious experiences have a Rorschach-like quality. They tell us more about the experiencer than they do about the experience. In light of this, in order to appeal to any of the experiences as evidence in favor of a particular religious worldview, rather than as someone having a strange experience and somewhat predictably interpreting it as religious, we need reason to think that these experiences represent reality as it really is. We certainly can't use religious experience as evidence for that, that would be to use religious experience to justify itself. Instead, we have to appeal to our earlier evidence, the other stuff I talked about, the external, empirical evidence gleaned from the observable, physical world. And that evidence simply does not favor the theist's position. On top of that, the theist of any particular stripe is already committed to saying that the vast majority of the widespread variety of purportedly religious experiences fail to represent how things really are. The Catholic doesn't believe in Shiva. So if someone claims to experience Shiva, they have somehow misinterpreted their experience. What this Catholic must remember is that this same skepticism applies to them as well. They cannot simply assume that their experiences are special because they're their own. This is why I find it reasonable to be an atheist. Now if I were shown that there is something that I need, that in principle I cannot account for on an atheistic framework, I would certainly abandon my atheism and be reasonable in doing so. But at this point, a rational defense of atheism just amounts to disarming theistic arguments that claim that we need to posit God in order to explain this or that, or in order for life to be meaningful, or for anything to exist at all, or what have you. But as an atheist with a healthy respect for science, I adopt a methodology of reevaluating my beliefs when they are called into question. This is why I think that it's important for atheists to enter into this kind of dialogue and to pay attention to the work of good theistic thinkers and good theistic philosophers of religion. If anyone can make a reasonable case for theism, it's them, people such as Professor O'Connor. This is an active discussion. This is an active debate. Consider the scientist who takes himself to be justified in rejecting a certain hypothesis, only to, as a result, stop keeping up on the relevant <coughs> literature. If there are new developments that would push him to reconsider his rejection, but he refuses to engage with them, because he found himself satisfied some time ago. He's simply being dogmatic. We must not be like that. Reason dictates a continued sensitivity to new considerations. Now, I've said a lot about what I take to be reasonable. Let me end with a note on what I take to be unreasonable. Ultimately, I don't care if we disagree about some things. Personally, I don't care much whether you believe that the universe has a creator or whether you think that evolution is guided by some architect. Admittedly, I care a little bit more about whether you believe that someone actually rose from the dead, but in the end, that's your concern. 
But what I do care about, personally, is what you do in the name of such beliefs. And I do care about those earlier things, but only insofar as they inform and motivate your actions. What I find unreasonable is the violence, physical and emotional, that is done in the name of any belief, theistic, atheistic, or otherwise. I find it unreasonable to suppose that if someone disagrees with you, they must be either stupid or wicked. I find unreasonable the in-group, out-group behavior and mentality that can go along with debates on topics such as these. The judgment and ridicule that one opens oneself up to by admitting, when in the wrong company, to being a theist or an atheist. That's unreasonable. Now, Professor O'Connor and I disagree about God. If he's right, I'm wrong. And if I'm right, he's wrong. That's a matter of necessity. So in a sense, we're rivals. But that doesn't mean we can't carry on in a friendly yet rigorous fashion. And it doesn't mean that we can't join forces against common enemies. In this case, our common enemies count two among their number. We can call these enemies hatred and ignorance. And they pose more of an immediate threat than either theism or atheism. Thank you. And now for approximately 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a chance to rest your voice there, Wes, and I'm going to ask Tim if you wouldn't mind responding to some of the issues that he's raised that you would like to perhaps address in a specific way, and in turn, I'm going to let you respond to that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Wes. Um, the issue of uh, um, religious arguments and whether they do or don't work, and of course, uh, like all topics in philosophy, philosophers uh, disagree on, on theistic arguments as they do on every other major substantive question that philosophers uh, address. Um, so it's not a simple matter of cut and dry um, where we can all just agree the, the arguments do or don't show this. There is disagreement, but and it's, it's frustrating, but there's disagreement among people that you take to be your intellectual peers, they're aware of the relevant considerations, um, but uh, sure, I, I, would, would we agree that it can be reasonable uh, if you take the evidence um, to, to tell one way and you're aware of the fact that some really smart people disagree with you on that, to nevertheless persist in your, in your belief? So I believe if you interpret the evidence in that way, like I said, um, when we have a belief called into question and it doesn't live up to the evidence, doesn't stand up under scrutiny, we have some options. We can reinterpret the evidence, we can reject the belief, we have a number of things that we can do, as long as we remain consistent. So what it might come down to is, I mean, I, I believe personally that these uh, various arguments for the existence of God, as I said, none of them actually work. Um, and even if they do work, I think they get conclusions consistent with the denial of theism. But this is largely because I reject a lot of their premises. I take myself to be justified in rejecting these premises based on other beliefs that I have, experience and evidence and so on and so forth. But I think it's perfectly conceivable that someone could see things very differently, accept these premises as true. And if they do, then the argument's getting a lot more force. Right, so, so you can have, you can have um, two parties that are um, both either equally or, or at any rate to a large degree justified in the beliefs they hold. They, they rigorously think through their beliefs, but of course, no more than one of them if, uh, can be correct. Right, and so that, that was the point I was, uh, I just wanted to, to emphasize, because people often, um, there's a bad tradition, unfortunately, in the history of philosophy, of philosophers talking about proofs for the existence of God. Uh, philosophers used to talk about proofs for all kinds of things, um, and we've become a little more chastened uh, over the years. And so we don't typically talk anymore about proofs so much as arguments that seem more or less powerful to us on various points. And that's the way I would think of theistic arguments. I think they have some force. Um, and uh, I, I, people, you, you spoke about a bunch of bad arguments don't add up to something you know, weighty. And of course I would agree if they're just flat out bad arguments. But you can have a bunch of arguments that have some measure of force and that together cumulatively make a case uh, for a belief. And I take this to be standard practice in science, right? You have accumula an accumulation of evidence. And I think that's a better way of thinking about this issue. But of course, smart theists and atheists are gonna come down differently on, on uh, how to weigh those different bits of evidence. That's frustrating, but that's, that's just the way things are. Uh, you know, sometimes if people, if you think that's unreasonable, if you think that any time you're aware of disagreeing with smart people who are aware of all the relevant evidence, um, that you're aware of, 
that you should withhold belief. Well, you know, consider that very principle of belief that says you should withhold, um, you know, your belief in the face of uh, conflicting judgments, right? Smart people disagree about that. I don't, I don't agree with that. I guess I shouldn't point to myself, but a lot of much smarter people than I disagree with that. That is, that's just one more philosophical view about the nature of reasonable belief that we disagree about, right? Uh, and so it seems like the only thing one can reasonably do is listen carefully to um, evidence, you know, the arguments of those who reasonably disagree, weigh what they say, and then you know, follow the beliefs how, how it seems to you. Um, and, and so I, I take it you'd agree with that. I certainly agree with that. Would you care to ask him a question? Sure. Um, so you were talking about uh, the various commitments of um, the theist, and you also mentioned that there are commitments of the agnostic and the commitments of the, uh, the atheist. I'm curious about this, since I essentially I take my position, I mean, atheism is a very, very broad uh, uh, position. It's, it's, a, it's a negative position. It's a position which says, not theism. Theism is false. I'm wondering what you take my commitments to be other than just the denial of theism. Yeah. So, well, I mean, implicit in atheism is the view that the cosmos or whatever the totality of physical reality turns out to be. Um, cosmologists are busily speculating about a bigger reality maybe than the universe we know about. But whatever the totality of physical reality to be, if you're an atheist, you say uh, it's, it's possible for such a thing to exist. And in fact, indeed, it's actual that, that such a thing could exist without any sort of reason for its existence. And what, uh, presumably, although different atheists think differently here, there being no internal reason, internal to, to physical reality. It just exists without explanation, right? So that, that's a commitment, that, that, that that's even so much as possible. It's a commitment to the idea that some things can exist without there being any principles of explanation whatsoever, either internal or external, to them for, for their existence. Well, it turns out then that I guess that I'm not an atheist because I don't share that commitment. Um, I do believe it's possible that there be an explanation of these things. I can't claim to say exactly what it is, but I think we have a framework for addressing these. Um, we can ask, okay, so the universe exists. Why? Well, maybe it's, it exists because it's best that it does. Uh, that would be a fundamental law which says that what is best is what is. I don't believe this, but it's a candidate, and it's also consistent with atheism. Or maybe we say that what, it, what is is what is most elegant. Uh, I also don't believe that, but it's another start. It's a little more plausible. It's consistent with atheism. Or we say that what exists exists because it's the most mathematically simple. We can give various purported explanations, and they all have a little bit of evidence in favor of them, given the fact that the universe does exist. Okay, good. Uh, so maybe we should distinguish then between um, what we might call atheism neat, or mere atheism, and then a, a kind of explanatorily souped up variety of atheism. Uh, and I guess so my initial, I think most people who are atheists are mere atheists, just, they just say the universe just exists. That, that's, you know, that, that's, that's all there is to be said, There's, there is no explanation to be given. Um, if you do try to appeal to, appeal to uh, a moral principle, I, I, I'd start asking questions. All right, now this is sounding like there's some substantive entity, call it a, a principle, some abstract object. And it, some, and it somehow has the capacity to guarantee the existence of a large physical totality. Um, I find that you know, a really, really surprising uh, uh, sort of idea. Um, I want to know about the nature of this law, what, what, what accounts for its reality, whatever it is, and what accounts for its creative power. Uh, but then we're, you know, then we're in the ball game, and, and I agree. Theistic arguments, typically philosophical theistic arguments, are for a very austerely described reality of something, you know, a um, self-existing, necessary being, um, immaterial, um, not not caused by other things, maybe having no parts, uh, and so on. And uh, you might say there's more than one. It, the old, there's more than one way to think about such a thing, I agree. And then you have to go on to give arguments, why should we interpret that thing if we think there must be such a thing as a personal reality, um, as we are. Uh, and you know, then we're in the business of giving arguments, but we've left, we've left typical atheism behind when we, when we make that move. Well, th thank you. Uh, I understand that there are a number of students here from Wes's class, is that correct? Could you raise your hands? Uh, you're getting extra credit, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Just Just she is with Steve. He's over there. Does, does, this, does this sound like your class? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I would like to uh, clarify, since you both have talked about appropriate places for faith and reason, could you, could you 
clarify, uh, is there a significant difference in your application of phase remaining? Could you put that in a nutshell? If there is a difference at all. Sure. Um, shall I go first? Um, so what is the difference between you know faith and reason in my own operations? Well, I'll admit sometimes I sometimes I have faith in all the senses that I mentioned. Sometimes I have trust, I have confidence, sometimes I hope, and sometimes I even believe without evidence. Everyone does. You can't help it. Um, but what I try to do is not I try to recognize when I'm believing without evidence and realize that my belief is kind of arbitrary at that point. And um, not use it to guide my actions, especially when those actions affect other people. I would never let a belief taken merely on faith, that is, faith, belief without evidence, to be a central part of my identity. No, I like evidence, reasons, justifications, that sort of stuff. I, I follow reason in that sense. I don't deify reason, but I like to give reasons to do what I do. I like to think, I'm going to do this. Why should I do it? Or, I believe this, why should I believe it? If I can't answer that question, I don't take the action, unless I absolutely have to, and um, I don't hold on to the belief, and if I do, I don't hold on to it for very long before reevaluating it. Yeah, um, so in the Christian tradition, it's not been standard, certainly among um, reflective people who've tried to characterize faith to say faith is um, believing in the absence, total absence of evidence. Uh, it, it's a complex question because faith does involve, as I said, trust in God, a reality one takes to there to be, and, and, uh, and trust in God's revealing of himself, what you take to be God's revelation. But I think there, there can be and there ought to be, if one's reasoning well, um, reasons for taking God to be, uh, to exist, and to have revealed himself yeah, through this particular religious tradition. Uh, but those reasons are, are probably not going to be utterly conclusive. It's going to be a matter of more or less, right? And so a distinctive thing about faith is you make a commitment, right? A trust in the absence of total certainty. Uh, is it reasonable to do that? Well, uh, think about human relationships, right? So I'm, I've been married now for 25 years almost. Um, you know, it, it, when I, I decide, if I, if I trust that my wife loves me, that she's faithful to me, um, do I do so on the basis of evidence? Yes, in part. Uh, but, you know, if I sat and tried to do a rational calculation of, you know, all the evidence I have and all the, the little things that could be potentially explained in, in, in less, um, less, less positive ways, right? I'm, you know, suppose I say, uh, well, I think, I think it would be well over 90% likely that my wife is faithful to me. She, would, she wouldn't be very happy if I just left it at that. And I observe, you know, and, and if day by day there was a kind of fluctuation in my assessment, of, of, of that, right? At some point, I, I, we take it to be a reasonable thing to do in inter, interpersonal relationships to make a commitment. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that we're blind to future evidence. Um, I could have very direct evidence of my wife's unfaithfulness, at which point it would be absurd for me to continue to believe that, right? But, uh, so, so there's, there's in, in interpersonal relationships, um, if one is to achieve certain kinds of goods, the good of relationship, one does have to, um, commit to trust where the evidence is, is not utterly compelling. It's just a matter of more or less. And in the question of religion, many writers, William James uh, famously uh, in his essay, The Will to Believe, said that you know, the problem with religion is uh, we've, we've got to make a choice. Um, however I live my life, I'm, I'm, I'm acting as if either for practical purposes, I'm taking it God doesn't exist or there's not really a religious dimension to reality or I make that choice. Um, but I, I've only got this life, I can't wait, right? I'll never be at a point. It's not like I can just say, well, since I'm not sure, I should, I should hold off because I can live another 50 years and it's not going to be conclusively settled to anyone's satisfaction, right? So I've got to make a choice how to live now and I think it, it, it can be reasonable to do that in the cases where, where the, the evidence, you don't judge the evidence to be conclusive. Uh, let me ask the, the question from a, a different perspective. Since we have two clearly defined positions here, you've both articulated them very well this evening, what would you say each of you would be, if you could put yourselves in the shoes of the, the other side, what are misconceptions that you would see, uh, Wes, that uh, theists have, Christians have, about your position, and on the other hand, what would be misconceptions that you think are very important to misconceptions on, uh, on the part of atheists with regard to the Christian perspective. So I think there are, there are three common ones. 
One is that atheists rely on reason, so we're all like Spock. Um, no. He's not. Um, and that's very much related to the second one. Um, that since we don't have faith in this robust sense, or use it as a guiding force in our life, that our lives lack beauty, that our lives are meaningless. Uh, no, this is not the case. I, I believe that life is a wonderful thing. I enjoy it. Uh, I know a lot of atheists who live very meaningful lives and who uh, contribute lots of value to the world. Uh, so I think that there's a very common misconception that if you're an atheist, you're somehow missing out on the beauty of the universe. I look up at the sky and I think, that is amazing that that has occurred like that on its own. It's moving. <laughs> and then the third misconception is that somehow we, we fail to believe in God, but we deify science. We go on and we, we worship at the altar of, of science. And this is just not the case. Science is a method that has been proven reliable. Just look at the last hundred years, the, the advancements in medicine and technology. These things are amazing. It's a method, like I said, that's been proven reliable, so I run with it. It gets results. In principle, I could even carry out the experience myself if I wanted to and get enough education, and I could get first-hand verification of this. That's not the same as just taking it on faith. It's very, very different. On top of that, well, there is no on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think a, a misconception that um, some atheists have, uh, typically atheists in, in a university context, uh, are, are that all religious people um, hate or fear science. Um, some, some do fear science, of course, um, but uh, that's, uh, very many do not. Uh, many, very many love uh, and, and celebrate the beauty of, of science as a, as a great human achievement. Um, uh, well, I suppose it, 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 we're in an election year. Um, it's a misconception, increasingly, uh, that all religious people have the same sort of political views, and that's very much not the case. Um, so I could just mention that. Um, that, but another thing is that um, uh, smart, educated atheists often press um, theists who aren't very well trained in subjects like philosophy, aren't especially articulate in um, expressing their beliefs and defending their beliefs, and then accuse them when they fail miserably at, at articulating a reasonable defense of their beliefs of being deeply irrational. And I, I think that's 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 misguided, so this isn't so much, this is, I just think this is misguided, a way of thinking about knowledge. Um, people often believe, uh, even really educated people, uh, a lot of things that they can't articulate very well. That doesn't mean their beliefs are not grounded, uh, not based in a variety of things. Uh, in the case of religion in particular, revealed re religion, a pu purportedly revealed religion like Christianity, uh, there's a division of labor. One is relying on the expertise of a, of a wide variety of people, right? Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an academic, so I spend time, I read stuff, you know, New, New Testament um, criticism and various sorts of things, but, but I'm not an expert in that. And, you know, pity the poor person who's not an academic who can't possibly um, read and, and, and properly digest that sort of stuff, but it's relevant to the, the reasonableness of Christian faith. So there's a distribution of labor that I take to be very similar to distribution of labor in science. You know, ask your biology professor about some question of physics, and she'll say, well, you know, go to go down to the physics department, right? Bio science has become hyper-specialized. No one is in possession of all the relevant information. The community possesses knowledge that no one individual possesses. And I, I, I think that's the right way to think about religious belief as well. We have a couple of microphones that are uh available for individuals that wish to ask a question. So at this point, we're going to open it up to individuals who've been listening for the past uh, hour. Uh, step up to the microphone. Do we have someone refereeing the microphones there? Yeah. I'm refereeing. Okay. Uh, let's start off with... Uh, hey, uh, you guys broached the topic early in the discussion. Um, I think you guys were talking about contingent existence, if that's what I heard. I think, uh, Tim... I was reading about you before I came here, and it seems like that's something you're excited about. Um, I'm excited about that too. Uh, I just know that we have our top scientists working around the clock on trying to explain why and how the universe. Um, and let's, you kind of, I feel like you dodged that a little bit. You gave some reasons and then you said you didn't believe them. I'm, I just want to hear you guys expound a little bit on contingent existence and 
Yeah, thank sure. You. So I didn't mean to dodge, I just, you know, time limit and all, but I'm glad that this is, uh, this is brought up again. So by continued existence, you mean why there's, uh, why there's something or rather than nothing? Or well, yeah, yeah, he was saying that, um, you know, you were saying that there could be reasons and, and um, you know, he's saying that, that there are and... So, we have this question, why is there something rather than nothing? And as you said, there are scientists who are, who are working on, well, a question in that neighborhood. Right. Um, how might we get, say, particles out of a particleless quantum field governed by certain laws? That's about the closest we can get in science, right? But the question of how to get something from actually nothing, much harder question. The question of why that happens is not a question for science at all. Um, but I think, look, so we can speculate about this all we want. We can give lots of different answers. We can say, no, it is just a brute fact. There just is stuff. I don't really like that. It makes me feel a little bit queasy because, I mean, what are the odds? I think it's so, so coincidental. Right? There's got to be some sort of explanation. But we can rattle off lots of potential explanations, um, almost all of which are cons consistent with atheism. So let's say that there's something rather than nothing because, well, it would be better such to, to return to that. That is, I mean, it does force us to wonder about well, what is this more fundamental law that says that, right? And why might we believe that it's true? Well, these are interesting questions, and that's the way the debate could go. Or we could say, look, um, the universe, there's something rather than nothing, because, well, perhaps, as Professor O'Connor said, reality is much bigger than we thought, right? It contains lots and lots of universes, one for every way things could be. Right? Then, of course, you know, there's going to be something in this region or whatever. Why does that exist? We can ask the question then, too. Right? There's lots of things we can ask. There's a framework we can have these debates in. And I don't see where, at any point, we have to say something like, oh, we need theism to answer it. Uh, did, did you want me to chime in on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Since sorry. I wrote a whole book on it, I should say yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, no, I just want to make the point that um, there are intrinsic limits to science, right? Sometimes people have wrong, wrongly drawn limits around science, and science has, has progressively pushed through those imposed um, lim limits. But I think if you reflect on the practice of science in very general terms, you can see that science can't, for example, justify its own starting assumptions. Right? And the starting assumption of science is that, that there are principles that are uniform throughout reality. So when we do experiments in very limited, very small fragments, we test very small little bits of this vast cosmos, that these reveal principles that hold in all the other parts of reality that we're not directly testing. Uh, science can't uh, justify its commitment to certain values in the forming of theories. Why do we think that simpler theories are more likely to be true? Right? It, it, a lot of philosophers of science have tried to give arguments. It seems very hard to give a, a rationale for why supposing simpler theories. Maybe the world is just devilishly complex at, at down at its bottom. Why, could, why, why can we rule that out a priori? So there are certain assumptions that science uh, has to make. And it, it also can't address questions of, of meaning or purpose, I believe. Uh, but finally, science can't address, and, and, and perhaps Wes uh, agrees with me here, uh, it, it can't address the most basic explanatory question we can ask, which is, why is there anything at all? Now, some scientists think you can uh, answer that question through science. Um, and I think there are basically three different ways they think of it. In, in a, going back to the 18th century, people said, well, suppose the universe never had a beginning, right? Then there's never a stage of reality that just sort of pops in, you know, and without explanation, because every stage has causal antecedents to what, what went on before. So we can explain every every stage of, of the world, every given time, in terms of what happened just before that time, and, and if we have the right laws of nature, we can we can account for that, right? Uh, but, you know, call that the way of eternity, right? This is the way of explaining why is there anything at all. But we can still ask the question, yeah, but why, why is reality like this, this sequence, this infinite sequence of events, as, as opposed to some other consistent sequence of events? Or sometimes people think, encouraged by 20th century physics, that the way to answer this question is to burrow deeper and deeper and to try to come up with the simplest possible uh, set of laws uh, to explain fundamental physical reality. And the, the limit, of course, would be a single law 
governing a single fundamental kind of particle or entity, be it a wave or something, right? That, that would be the maximally simple kind of explanation there could be. Uh, Steven Weinberg, famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, said he, the dream of physics is to have the equation of the universe uh, so simple that you can put it on the t-shirt of a stupid teenager and then the teenager can know the answer the riddle of existence. But still we can, we can ask, why is the universe governed in accordance with that fundamental principle, populated by that kind of stuff, whatever it is, as opposed to something else? Or finally, and this is very recent physics, sometimes physicists think, well, if it turns out that our reality is just one of all the possible forms of physical reality, right? We can't see all the others, disconnected from our reality, right? Uh, that, would, that would account for um, why things are the way they are, because they, they, they seem to think, that, well, it would just have to be that way. But we could still say, yeah, but why is, why is reality constituted by uh, you know, an infinite or even non-denumerably infinite uh, number of universes as opposed to 17 or just one or, or zero, right? Uh, so ultimately, scientific explanation has to give out if it's based in empirical considerations. That's where philosophy takes over with, with its um, uh, you know, disputed views. For me, I think theism provides a really elegant explanation for that. Uh, Hello. My, or, uh, my question is more so for Professor O'Connor, but I mean, I like Wes too. And both of you guys, both of you guys touched on this. Uh, in your opening speech, you were listing off a lot of things that you thought had come up in uh, um, or that have been recent scientific discoveries that supported theism, and you just mentioned briefly evolutionary biology. Uh, I fittingly spent my mother's day studying the laws of DNA and inheritance, and along with that, uh, you know, the history of evolution and all the evidence for it. And I actually, I, I don't know, I feel while reading it uh, surprised that it's the way creation unfolded. I feel like between special creation, where everything was just made intact how it is, and the long process of evolution with all of its casualties, I, I feel more surprised that evolution ended up being the way that it happened because of all the casualties. I really like uh, soul-making and free will uh, theodicies for the problem of evil, but those don't apply to most of the billions of years of life on planet Earth. And I really feel like if the process of evolution had been super effective at keeping creatures alive, even if, say, there was predation, where creatures feast on one another, but if it was really effective at all the young being reared and all of them coming to, like, full lives or something like that, then and it kept creatures, uh, lots of creatures in, uh, in existence for a longer period of time, maybe there were far less extinctions, I feel like thieves would really jump on that and say, look at how life-preserving God's method of creation was. So I guess I'm just asking why you think that was something that you think confirms theism, when it seems actually a lot more surprising given the idea that life is you know, the ultimate good that the fine-tuning of the universe was supposed to get to. And then maybe Wes can talk about it too. <laughs> well, there's a lot going on there. Um, I'll, I'll just pick up on a, a bit of it. So, I mean, the important thing to see um, about evolutionary biology and um, Richard Dawkins has, has, has a hard time, I think, seeing this, uh, which is that evolutionary biology is not a foundational science, right? And you have to think about that. It rests on biochemistry, which rests on you know, physical chemistry, which rests ultimately on fundamental physics, right? That is, that, that the fact that there is a biosphere capable of sustaining evolutionary processes and giving rise to more complex forms of life over time uh, depends on the physics that holds matter together being as it is. And you might say, well, you know, that, that's okay. You know, physics could have been this way or that way, and we still could have had evolution. And what turns out to be really surprising in the last 30 years, physicists uh, have said uh, that the, the, the fundamental physical laws, at least as best we currently know them, seem to be exquisitely fine-tuned for life. That is, uh, if the laws had been very minutely different in, in small mathematical ways, you know, things like Planck's constant, I think it's 10 to the negative 34th power or something, and what if it had been 10 to the negative 33.7, right? Turns out, oops, you wouldn't have had a world with life, right? And there, there are just on and on numbers of factors like that, that if, in the advent of computer age where we can generate, imagine beginnings where laws or the initial distribution of matter was different, and then 
play out the film? How would things have unfolded? Could living things have arisen in the fullness of time? And it turns out that in almost every case, either the, the matter um, spreads out much too quickly, right? So that attractive forces can't take hold, and so you just got isolated particles floating out there, right? Or things compress too quickly, and you don't get differentiation. It turns out to be really, really hard if you're trying to design a universe, right? And give it a law like structure in fundamental physical terms to have one that's capable of sustaining life. Now, that's. That's just an observation. That's not by itself an argument, as Wes well knows. Um, I do think there's an interesting argument here. It provides some, at least in a certain explanatory context, it, sorry for all this academic hedging, uh, it, 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 it actually is relevant to the issue of theism, I believe. Uh, now, the issue of the wastefulness of evolution and the process that bothers many people, uh, uh, you, you know, wasteful from, from whose standpoint? You know, if God, God is uh, timelessly eternal, right? Um, the idea that you know it should have taken a long, long, long time before there came to be interesting beings like us and cats and things like that. Um, you know, God's not in a hurry. Um, uh, so efficiency is not a value that really applies to an omnipotent creator in the way it does for human beings who live short, finite lives and can only accomplish so much. Um, uh, suffering, of course, is a, a relevant datum, and Wes touched on this, and uh, animal suffering. I mean, this is something that science has taught us that we wouldn't have known pre-Darwin or uh, pre-geology and Darwin in the 19th century, namely that animals were existing and many of them suffering for millions and millions of years before there were ever human beings. So you can't pin it all on uh, the fall of Adam and Eve, right? Um, and so what do you think about that if you think um, animal suffering uh, has moral significance? Uh, this is a, a really, a really, it's probably the biggest challenge to theistic belief. Uh, the one thing I would say though about that is Notice what we're doing when we we think you know we think really hard and we say, hmm, why would a uh, omnipotent, omniscient, holy good being uh, create a world where there's that much really intense suffering that for you know uh, what purpose could it serve? And we think really hard about it. And in some cases, we think we can see purposes behind. It. So there is redemptive suffering. Right? We all recognize that in some cases, but in a whole lot of cases, we we, we can't for the life of us see it in human beings. And then in animals, it's even worse, right? Um, because animals don't have, you know, kids of character building. They don't have the kind of psychology we have that, that that kind of explanation could take hold on, right? And so we draw blanks, right? Um, now, is this powerful evidence against the existence of God? Well, it is, provided that um, were there good reasons that for such a being um, to have, to create a world like that, um, we would be aware of what those reasons are. That is, we're taking it to be evidence because we're, we're surveying, collectively, as human beings, what possible explanations there could be, and we can't come up with any. And so we take it that God doesn't have any. But I would say, you know, the gulf between us and an omnipotent, omniscient creator is far, far vaster than the gulf between us and a young, us adult human beings, and a young child, say, who might have to undergo suffering for reasons she can't understand that we know we can't communicate. Right? Or, you know, if I'm playing chess with a chess grandmaster and he seems to make a complete blunder, right? Moves his queen out into the open where I can just snatch it, right? At seemingly no cost, right? Uh, I'd be a fool uh, if I took it by look and I said, I can't see a reason, I can't see any hidden strategy here, being the chess novice that I am, you know, for thinking there is no reason, right? So we have to discriminate between circumstances where, and now sometimes, sometimes not being able to see something is good evidence for the non-existence, not, not proof, but very good evidence. So we have to distinguish between cases where it is good evidence and cases like the playing the chess grandmaster where it's not, right? Uh, and then the question is, what kind of situation are we in when we try to speculate about the poss a possibly existing omnipotent, omniscient, holy good creator uh, and whether such a being might choose to allow intense suffering, right? And, and uh, I would say we could see some reasons a being might have Right? But it would be ridiculous to say that I could, I could access all the reasons an omnipotent being would have. I mean, think about, uh, sorry, I'm going on a little bit here, uh, but just you know, think about it this way. Um, you know, for a human being to try to hold in our mind what has happened in world history just for the last five years, we, we just have a bare sketch. You might recall a bunch of events that had happened, but in a very sketchy outline, we're very limited cognitively. Right? Now you imagine an om omniscient being right, that is putting, embedding things in a possibly infinitely timeless, 
time-bound infinite um, series of things, right? And you know, we can't fathom how things might look from, from that vantage point. I tell you, philosophers have a lot to say. <laughs> so just a few thoughts. Uh, there was a lot to cover there, so I'll just hit some highlights. Um, so I would actually love to just sit here and talk about the appearance of fine-tuning in the universe for the rest of the night. I think that would be fun, but it might, might bore some people. But I think that's a fascinating topic, but really I just... It seems to just, I mean, we get as much um, evidence in favor of theism from that as we do in favor of a multiverse hypothesis or any number of a number of atheistic alternatives. So I really just think that sort of thing might be a non-starter. But I think that the, the stuff about um, evolution and sort of needless suffering, apparently needless suffering throughout history, is really interesting. And Professor O'Connor is right to point out uh, that this is a big problem for the theist. And if the theist is serious, about her faith and her position, this, this is a serious thing to grapple with. These are considerations that can't just be written off. We need to think about this. Even if we conclude that we're limited, well, we need to, we need to acknowledge that and actually struggle with this and feel those pangs of, man, what do I say about this problem? You can't just write it off like it's not a problem at all. But notice that what we have to do now in order to explain this suffering is posit mysteries, posit things that are unexplained uh, as of yet, perhaps in principle unexplainable by us. And we, we might even, in order to make sense of the evil uh, that we see in the world today, if we had a pre-human suffering, we have to, uh, as Professor O'Connor just read, perhaps posit a doctrine of the fall or something like that. Now, if we started off and want to say, look, theism as an explanatory device is simple. Notice how much we're complicating it now. Notice how much we're introducing additional claims. Notice how much we're introducing mystery. It's making it harder and harder to verify. The more sober scientific alternatives are starting to look a little bit more attractive at that point, I think. Thank you. Uh, I've got a tweet here uh, of someone. This is with regard, actually, to a uh, comment you made earlier with respect to t-shirts and putting cosmic formulas on them that would explain the entire universe. Well, someone has asked, you know, that there's something that often does appear on t-shirts, which is the statement, it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. Would you care to comment on that, Wes? Yeah, there's some book with that, and oh, okay. the closely related title, so I not really understood it, except for that I gather that in the book, um, there's systematic misinterpretation of both David Hume and Emmanuel Kant. Um, but, so, don't have enough faith to be an atheist, or it takes faith to be an atheist. I'm really wondering, so what does faith mean there? Um, I mean, is it just sort of like, is, is it this sort of earlier commitment that you were, you were gesturing at, like I have to have faith that there's no explanation? Well, I don't have faith in that. In fact, I think it's probably likely that there is an, an, ex, that there is an explanation to these sorts of things. Um, is it that I, I don't have enough confidence to be an atheist? No. Is it that I don't have enough hope to be an atheist? No, I actually, I actually, find the world, this is maybe idiosyncratic, a little bit more hopeful of a place as an atheist. Right? Um, I'm not really sure what the charge is there. It sounds like something flashy to put on a t-shirt so that we can be like, gotcha, but I don't know what the substance is. So I'm just not sure how to respond. Uh, let's go to another, oh, by the way, I've uh, just been informed that because of the uh, interest that this has generated, we're going to be going uh, a little bit over in terms of the a lot of time for this uh, dialogue. So if you're, stand, if you're standing in line, uh, we might get to your question over here. Hi, everybody. So uh, I am a student of psychology, which is basically using the scientific method uh, applied to human behavior. And uh, the there is a huge limitation to the scientific method, and that is that you can't actually prove anything. You can only disprove things. So. Um, you know, I use what I call working knowledge, which is mainly believing things that haven't been disproved yet. But, uh, so, you know, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of things in the Bible that have been disproved, like all of Genesis, for example. The world's more than 5,000 years old, and uh, the whole human civilization wasn't spawned by Adam and Eve, obviously. So there's a lot of evidence, or things disproving, um, you know, religious doctrine. So I'd be very curious to hear um, what someone has to say about about that. And how, how can you be, I, I think that it takes a lot of faith to be religious um, in order to believe in these things when there's evidence contradicting that. Okay, yeah, now make sure I 
keep, I mean, I'm brief. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so the thought that, you know, the, the early chapters of Genesis with the creation story and Adam and Eve in the garden and so on have been falsified uh, by science um, presupposes that they were intended to depict literal, literal history. And of course, uh, that came to be a view that, that was not in, in historically uh, that, that was a view held by some prior to our having scientific evidence one way or the other. It was rejected by others, go all the way back to St. Augustine uh, in the early 5th century AD. He rejected the, that, that, that sort of reading of Genesis. Um, and it's a, I can't get into it, it's a really fascinating historical question of why this sort of view became very, not only deeply entrenched, but held as a foundation of belief in much of conservative Protestant theology in the 19th and 20th century, right? But that's, it's, uh, and, but then the question is, but are, are they reading the book rightly? Well, here's the guy, you know, that you need to ask, a, a professor of ancient Near Eastern literature. Um, there, there's very good reason, I take it, um, that my inexpert reading of, of people who write about this stuff to think it was never intended to communicate history in the way that we understand it. Uh, there, there's lots to say about this. So I, I would say it's not disproved because it, it was never asserting what many Christians falsely took it to be saying. And that's why I talked about we do gain new insights partly through science, but also through the study of, of uh, ancient literatures where we, we it, sh it illuminates uh, not just Genesis, but even the Gospels and some parables and things. You can find things from surrounding cultures that suddenly open up and go, aha, now I see what's going on here. Otherwise, it wasn't, wasn't at all clear. So that's my quick answer. Uh, yes, great. Uh, I really appreciate uh, this discussion. And you know, if I had a choice of uh, things to do, uh, this would be one of the things that I would put on that list to have these types of discussions and in the context of my relationship with the diversity of people whom I interact with, I do get a chance to have these kinds of conversations in the, in the context of friendly relationship and, and, and um, all of that. But one of the things that often comes up, particularly when we have this type of intellectual and academic debate about these things, is what about the sociological phenomena that um, you know sort of impact the planet? The things that have been catalyzed by the faith, the Christian faith, or the belief in the God uh, that have had transforming impact on the planet. And more to my point, those people who don't have access to the resources or the context that would allow for the kind of reason debate that um, we could engage in in this environment. What would be an atheistic argument to influence the type of social good or self-sacrificing behavior that has taken place that have propelled certain sociological phenomena forward uh, to, to impact the planet? So are you asking, you know, as an atheist, what line would I offer to try to get people who are not, say, academic per se, uh, to be good? people and push forward and, and two two thoughts I guess I mean that's that's probably the lower bar mm -hmm. relative to my question but I think of someone for example like Martin Luther King who, mm -hmm. who comes to mind only because we're using him as a champion of faith in one of the discussions that I have okay it was clearly his faith in God his belief in something beyond this life that influenced him and there are many like him throughout history who did not um, who, who made their choice because they believed in something that transcended this life that was explained by theism, by the fact that there's a loving God who would inspire and encourage and empower someone to take those types of actions. So, absent that, what would be a, com uh, a complimentary or, or a, an argument from atheism that might inspire the same type of action on behalf of individuals? Well, just take out God and higher being and just throw in goodness and reality. Say, be motivated by that, please. Um, well, what I'm looking for specific is also some examples of where you see that have taken place. Where I see it have happened. some examples of people or sociological phenomena that might have been inspired by that atheistic position. Hmm. So, sociological phenomena that push people towards being good inspired by atheism. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. Um, I wouldn't take that as argument that there aren't any, just imaginative failure on my part. But, um, but um, I mean, I think of a lot of uh, ethicists working in philosophy departments today who are coming up with theories of what we should do, and some of them are quite motivating and compel people to do things like donate money to Oxfam, 
or um, you know, give up meat out of their diet, or take any sort of various uh, actions that they can that they can take in order to alleviate suffering. And most of these are done without any any sort of appeal to God. Um, they're done appeal to, with appeal to goodness or rightness or to our fellow persons and <laughs> individuals or to an appeal to the fact that it's just plainly obvious that suffering is bad. Um, if we need any sort of argument for that, just look at the fact that every person avoids it. Right? We don't like suffering. Right? We, we, we flock away from it. Someone's thinking, what about the masochist? And they, they like pain. Uh, I'm talking about suffering here. We can make perhaps a subtle distinction. Um, so I think, I'm not sure what else we might need. Um, you know, I, I say, great, I'm motivated by goodness and, and rightness and uh, the alleviation of suffering. And really, I think that's what most people are motivated by in the end. I don't think that anyone is motivated by the fact that there is a God to go out and do things. This is the fact that there's an ultimate explainer in this abstract sense isn't morally motivating in some way. You need other moral principles to say something like, God wants us to act in moral ways, and then we wonder what morality is, and then we pursue that. Something along those lines. Uh, I've got another tweet here that uh, you may wish to comment on, I think, briefly, is the, the question, is doubt inherently a virtue? I think it's responsible. Um, whether that makes it a virtue? Sure. Um, but I think that I think that all sides can agree to that. I mean, crippling doubt isn't, isn't a virtue. Uh, paralyzing doubt isn't a virtue. But a healthy sense of doubt, which is maybe just saying, look, I'm fallible. I might be wrong about things. Um, I'm going to adopt my beliefs. I recognize I don't, I don't have absolute 100% probability one certainty in all of my beliefs. I might have good reason to believe them. As we said earlier, it's oftentimes a matter of degree. But I need to be open to revision. Yeah, I'll just, I mean, briefly, um, I, I think I agree with uh, Wes's basic point, which is that sort of measure skepticism about new claims, right, um, uh, is, is warranted until, until you have evidence for that. So if that's all that's meant by doubt, of course, that, that, that's a good thing, not to, to leap in blindly without any, any reasons for doing so. But doubt is not a virtue if it means a persistence, refusal to ever commit to something's being true just because you can't absolutely prove it in a mathematical sense, right? I think there are a lot of things that science show, show us that it's just unreasonable to doubt if you are informed of the relevant evidence, even though there's no such thing as proof in science in a strict mathematical sense, right? It's always possible to come up with an alternative explanation that might be you know, really ad hoc, really um, complicated in ways that seem deeply implausible, but, but you could always allow it, yeah, but it, this could be the, the true story. But we, I, I think it's unreasonable um, to hold out on that basis. We have four in line here. We'll have to cut it off at those four. We have three over there. And then we're asking people to submit their questions, and we'll keep the website open, and we'll continue the dialogue even after tonight. My question is, why is it that we require religion to be about truth at all? I mean, it seemed to me sort of uh, what we used to call in my days of philosophy an ill-formed uh, question. Um, why can't we regard religion in the same way we do art or poetry or music. In other words, no one says that the Rolling Stones song, the, we, you, you got it, uh, well, what was the, what was the song, uh, you can't always get what you want. Yeah. Nobody claims that's true, but it says something profound about the human condition. Why, does, why can't we say that religion does the same thing? It says a lot about the human condition, but why is it that we require it to be true? But, um, first, I think we should say to our college students, it really is true, you can't always get what you want, you need to know that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it, it, no, it's not required. Uh, true Christianity has uh, traditionally understood itself to be staked on truth claims, right? Now, one could reinterpret the Christian religion, and, and people have, right, uh, to, be, to, to be taken just to be a very Baroque, way of expressing deep moral or aesthetic truths, but that's not the way Christians uh, un uh, understand their faith. You know, the, the Apostle Paul uh, said in writing to Christian believers, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then we are to be pitied more than all men. Our faith is in vain, right? It's, it requires the truth of an historical claim of a really extraordinary sort uh, for basic Christian doctrine to make sense. Um, so it, it, you can choose, you know, which way to go, and then we could we could ask whether that's a more reasonable form of religious belief. But it's just 
it, 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 you shouldn't come along and say, here, here are you religious people, here's what you ought to believe, here's what you really are, are doing. You're not really making claims about reality, because, because we are. We really do believe certain things. Yeah, I think I, think I agree with that. Um, and the claims that I contest when I contest religious claims are not claims about what we might say somewhat poetically about the human condition, but the sort of fact-seeking claims that Professor O'Connor has mentioned. Um, it seems to me that people pr practicing religious folk oftentimes do take themselves to be getting at the truth of the world, and this is one reason why they take it so seriously. We would not fight wars over just poetic expressions of the human condition. Um, when I say, God gives me an entitlement to this land and not you, I don't think that's me just expressing, hey, I really want it. I think, I think we're, there's something more going on there, and it's, it's good to respect that. Although I have, I have seen some individuals who, uh, for whom fighting words are, don't take my great mental record off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have another one over here. Um, I have one question. So why do you think God revealed himself 2,000 years ago instead of, say, for example, in the First World War, Second World War, um, you know, when Hitler decided to prosecute the Jews, or say, for example, when Bush decided to go to Iraq. Um, it's, it's a bit interesting that God, God had revealed himself 2,000 years ago um, to specific place in the world and specific people. I cannot help but think that that idea, if, you know, thought to people was like, you know, a, a, a religious worldview, it's a bit selfish, a bit cruel, and a bit, um, why specific people are chosen while others are not, why they're being created in the first place. It's a bit of, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, we could speculate about why, if, if God has uh, revealed himself somewhere in history, why here rather than there. There's some interesting facts about um, uh, the, the world in which um, Jesus of Nazareth came and the, and the Roman Empire with the existence of roads and means of communication. There's some interesting things. We might say that there are certain propitious circumstances going on. But really, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think it's perfect as a Christian, um, and speaking respectfully for other theists and uh, others who are not Christians, uh, but I, I do think it's a profound truth of Christianity that God has incarnated himself, he's become one of us, and that I think we can better understand God and relate to God by the fact that he has made himself literally to be one of us, as Christians believe um, was true of, of Jesus Christ. And that requires, to be human is to, as this man on my right will tell you, is to live in a certain culture, speak a certain language, have a certain mindset. Um, it's just to, that, that's, we, we are particular in all the different ways represented here and around the globe, right? Um, arrogance, um, uh, yeah. Well, uh, the only thing, I, it could be arrogant if, if the faith taught we're special and other people are not. And of course, sometimes Christians have expressed their faith that way. I would say the Christian faith does not teach that, right? God chose the Jewish people, he made a nation, so that they would be a blessing to all nations, right? So it, they, they played a unique functional role in human history, but they weren't special, especially favored by God in the sense, in the sense of um, God prefers them to other human beings for some arbitrary reason. No, he called them to play a special role, right? All human beings are equally valued in the eyes of God according to Orthodox Christian teaching. Uh, this is a question for you, Dr. O'Connor. Um, I'm just curious why specifically Christianity? Why do you think that uh, God came down, became incarnate, uh, and died and rose from the dead on the third day? Uh, what What are your reasons? I mean, you gave us a little bit, but I was just wondering if you could flesh them out and um, I don't know, maybe give us more info of why Christianity rather than another. Yeah. Um, well, I guess there's, there's a whole range of things, but just, you know, really briefly, I think that if, on philosophical grounds, you think it's, it's um, likely or reasonable to think that God exists, I think it's likely to think that God would choose to reveal himself in some way or another. We could talk about why, but I, I think you can make a good case for that. Not proof, but... It's reasonable to think that. And once, you, once you're in the mindset of thinking that, well then, you know, as I kind of briefly alluded to, you got to survey the globe and say, well, where might such a being have revealed himself if that was what he wanted to do? And there, there are competing candidates for such a revelation, right? I think some have better claims than others. Uh, and, you know, for me, I, I find the case for Christianity more compelling than for 
for um, other monotheistic um, religious faiths. Um, I think uh, the person of Jesus of Nazareth was, was a very extraordinary individual, um, as reflected in, the, in the, the lives of the people who knew him and wrote about him. Um, and uh, we, you know, if, if we're to reject Jesus' own self-understanding, um, then we've got to put a certain interpretation on who he was as a human being. Um, and I find it more plausible to put the interpretation on, on uh, that individual and, and the whole surrounding circumstances and what we know and what evidence we have to say that he really was sent from God. Um, and, but if, if that's right, right, he made, cl he made claims of divinity about himself. I know it's a, it's a widespread, I think, false view that people have, well, no, he didn't actually do that. The, the, the later church did that, but I, I think that's just not sustainable. He really did make claims to divinity about himself. And um, so yeah, there, there's a whole lot of things to talk about the historical evidence um, for the resurrection, which I do would, would point to. I do think there is some, some evidence for, for the resurrection. Um, and just the message of Christianity is, is powerful um, and compelling to me morally. Um, so there's, yeah, those are some of the sorts of things I'd point to. At the political science department, uh, in an oral exam, I was asked the question, how can you balance the good and the evil that happened during the colonization of Americas? And as I was thinking, I said, uh, I, I, I can't. I said, as, as far as for good and evil to exist, that must be a personification. Uh, there are people who suffer. And I wonder if there would be any evil or suffering if there was no burning deer. So that, that question, so, so my, my thinking takes me to, would the impersonification of evil be an answer to the suffering that happened, let's say, before the sin or before Adam and Eve? Would okay. the impersonification of it, you said, or the personification? Personification, yes. So, the personification of evil, so taking evil to be some sort of entity in its own right, some sort of agent. We could do that, but again, notice... I see. So is the worry that um, absent, human, absent human beings to make judgments, this wouldn't necessarily be evil per se, but something something a little bit less bad, something just more natural, less, less evaluative? Because um, if that's the case, I mean, we can run the problem not with evil. Like, we say evil a lot, but really what we mean is suffering. We say evil because it has fewer syllables and it sounds more tough or something. But suffering is really the word. Um, needless suffering is, is, is bad. Um, it's undesirable. And um, if we can eliminate needless suffering, we ought. And I take it that most people in the room believe that if it was within your opportunity to easily alleviate some suffering, I gather that you would. Um, if you were walking past Mirror Lake, right, right outside, and there was a small child in it, and you could just reach in and save the child from drowning, you would. Um, you know, if it was, if it was not a child but a drowning, uh, what's 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 an animal? What's a nice animal? Uh, cat. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a drowning cat, you, you'd probably save that too. Um, because we don't want these things to suffer, and we think if we can prevent it, then we ought. When we have the means, of course. We don't always have the means. Sometimes we just can't do it. Our arms aren't long enough to reach the drowning child or the drowning cat, and we don't have time to get help from anyone else. Um, but God's arms aren't, aren't limited like that. Uh, you might think that if God existed at this point, God would have the means, the desire, and the knowledge to prevent all of this suffering, the needless suffering. Uh, the suffering that we, in that position, were we able to, would eliminate ourselves. The question is, why not? And I take that to be a serious challenge. If I could just briefly chime on that. Um, Wes, uh, I think we have to add a qualification to what's Wes, what Wes said, that we would all agree that we, we would eliminate suffering if we could easily do so. We would, we, we, we would feel obliged to eliminate suffering unless there was some, uh, uh, you know, worse suffering that might come from uh, 
preventing that suffering. So an obvious, simple example, um, as a parent, I could easily have, have prevented my, the suffering of my children when they got inoculation shots uh, when they are infants, right? But I didn't do that because um, the, the risk of exposure to debilitating disease was, was far worse than the, that, that suffering. And so then we have to ask, if, you know, that's, that's what we have to say when it comes to the case of God. Is there some way good that can be, uh, that, that, that is brought about um, through permitting even horrific kinds of suffering that we see? Um. I'm going to uh, bring this to a close at this point. This could continue on for some time further. But what I am going to ask is that our two guests this evening uh, encapsulate in maybe a minute or two, based upon the discussions that we've had this evening, listening to one another, uh, if you could leave us with some parting thoughts that would pull together some of the things you would like us to walk away with. All right, since you both looked at me, I guess I'll go first. Um, so. I didn't come here tonight to try to change anyone's mind, and quite frankly, I hope I didn't. If your mind was changed by what I said, you didn't think about it long enough. <laughs> um, but I hope that I did expose you to some considerations. Um, by you, I mean both the theists and the atheists and the agnostics in the room. Um, there are reasonable and morally good and fulfilling ways of being an atheist, um, and I think that there are reasonable and fulfilling and morally good ways of being a theist. In order to figure out which one is right, we have to dialogue with one another. We have to ask really, really hard questions, living questions. It's not an easy task, and it's not a cut and dry case. But to just echo some of the remarks that I made earlier, I hope that in the meantime, while we're trying to figure out whether or not there really is this ultimate explanation, this, this being that, that grounds everything else, we try to be good people in the meantime, and we stop persecuting each other based on the fact that we don't agree. We stop passing judgment, we stop emotionally and, and physically abusing one another, and just try to be decent. In the end, whether or not there is a God isn't all that interesting. What is interesting is what you do in the name of the presence or absence of that God. That's ultimately what I think we should care about. Um, I, I suppose I would uh, want to emphasize in closing the, the communal nature of uh, faith-seeking understanding. Um, responsibility to contribute to the pursuit of um, understanding within the Christian uh, community uh, depends on uh, one's time and talent. Um, it's a particular duty for those who have intellectual and artistic training, and so it, it, it's a duty incumbent on every Christian now sitting in this room. Um, different people with their different gifts uh, are able to, to um, uh, make different kinds of contributions, and it's not just purely intellectual. Um, uh, Christianity teaches that um, the, uh, the, at the core of God is love, and that's an affective thing. And understanding love requires the ability to empathetically to relate to other people. So people of deep moral goodness can often disclose things about the nature of God uh, that someone who might have a lot of intellectual knowledge uh, might not be able to fully appreciate. Um, visual artists. I think, disclose beauty, right? God is, is the source of beauty as well. Uh, they contribute to the Christian understanding of God. Um, you know, a theologian who has experienced grinding poverty in the Southern Hemisphere sees, reads the Gospels, understands the message of God's redeeming love differently than those of us who live in an affluent North American society, right? They contribute, and I don't think any, any one Christian, no matter how learned, um, uh, and how experienced can fully appreciate what the Christian message is about. It's because I, I have limitations of my perspective, and uh, so it's, again, it's a lot like science. It, it gets disclosed by the community as a whole. We all contribute to it. Neither of our guests this evening has taken cheap shots at the other, and I think we can be very grateful that we have had a smorgasbord this evening of some truly profound thoughts. You have ennobled the profession of philosophy, <laughs> both of you. We thank you for your presence here this evening. Let's give it a moment. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.